That was so mean. He's just so mean. Well, we are back on the air, lecture 58. We just uh, did a mean-spirited prank on Kelly, who um, I know has an issue about getting here to class, and I know why, so I don't make a big deal out of it, but hopefully you'll accept that in jest. Uh, let's do one problem that will wrap us up from 8.9. Uh, applications. Uh, to be honest with you, what I went, what I chose our second example, I went through the list of problems starting with 27 on page 629 and the problem that I knew the least about, I chose that for an example. Uh, you don't have to know about the physics or the um, circuits or whatever it is in the problem as long as we've got enough information handed to us we can take the mathematics, manipulate that, and hopefully come up with what it is that they want. Uh, did anybody try the numbers that we came up with yesterday for the error estimate to see if it was 4.17 times 10 to the negative tenth times the uh, mass of the object at rest? Not that that's important, but if somebody did and validated that, that's fine. Um, all right, let's take a look at problem 27. Uh, and when we're finished with this, then we'll start to review for the exam by, I think, since it's the most recent, uh, let's take the test that um, about half of you got back today and others of you got back prior to today, kind of work our way through that, common mistakes that I saw, what might you see, uh, on the exam um, relative to what you're seeing on test four. All right, 27. Let's read it through together, and then we'll see. Some of you, I'm sure, will feel more comfortable with this content than others. Um, try to throw that uh, comfort level out the window. If you're handed enough information and you convert it to stuff that is related to what we're doing, Taylor series or binomial series, uh, we should be able to get the answer in the form that they want it. 27 on page 629. An electric dipole can say, well, I started kind of um, glazing over when I got the word electric because I'm just not very well versed in that. Electric dipole consists of two electric charges of equal magnitude and opposite sign. If the charges are Q and negative Q and are locate at, located at a distance lowercase d from each other, then the electric field E at the point P in the figure, and I'll, we'll draw the figure up here, is such and such. Let's go ahead and write that down while we're there. So they hand us an equation. They tell us what these things are. For the most part, we haven't gotten all of it yet. By expanding this expression for E as a series in powers of lowercase d over capital D, show that, and here's what we're supposed to end up with, show that E is approximately proportional to 1 over d cubed when capital P, the point P, is far away from the dipole. Now, it doesn't really say in the reading, but it does in the diagram that what is capital D, it is the distance from this point to the first of the two charges. So here's the diagram. So here's point P. Here's the two charges in the dipole. The distance between them is lowercase d. And the distance of the point, which it's supposed to be, and this is kind of the how we're able to simplify at the end, that capital D is a much larger number as compared to lowercase d. Okay, charges are Q and negative Q located at a distance lowercase d from each other than the electric field E at the point P in the figure is, we've got it written down, by expanding this expression for E as a series of powers of, so we want powers 
of lowercase d over capital D. And that's not handed to us in the expression, so we do have to kind of manipulate that a little bit. When P is far away from the dipole, so when capital D is large compared to lowercase d. This is probably, this guy right here, is probably the expression that we're going to end up manipulating. It actually is capital D plus lowercase d to the negative 2. So we're going to use that binomial series, which is rooted in Taylor series. So we want to convert that so it has a lowercase d over capital D. So I think the first expression we can leave alone. The second expression um, inside here, let's factor out a capital D. So it's inside the parenthetical statement that is, in fact, being squared. So if we factor a D out of here, it leaves 1. That kind of helps the cause, because we like the 1 plus x to the k format. I'm sorry. We are used to using the 1 plus x to the k. Some of you don't like it, and you've told me that, which is not very nice at all. Uh, and when we factor D, capital D, out of here, it leaves 1. What about when we factor capital D out of here? You get the lowercase d over the capital D, so it probably is the right thing to do since we want powers of lowercase d over capital D. So inside the quantity that's being squared, I just factored out a capital D. That is also squared, right? because it was inside the quantity that was being squared, so I can't undo that, but I can kind of bring it out from this quantity. That would probably be the next step. So this capital D is squared, and we've got a 1 plus lowercase d over capital D squared. And by not only factoring out that capital D to get us what we want as far as what's requested of us, we've also got a Q over D squared, right, in both of these. So it's 1. It's in there one time. And what would be left here? One plus, plus D plus. over capital D, the negative 2? Yes. Does that work? If we factor out Q over D squared. I don't know how much of this I actually wrote down. I guess I didn't write that down. Does that work? I'm going to rewrite this because it's kind of sloppy. So the directions, I know I've read them twice, just make sure. Expanding the expression for E as a series in powers of lowercase d over capital D. So I think we're going to be good with that. So we're going to use this format. By the way, if there's any doubt in your mind about whether binomial series will make it to the final exam, you can pretty much lock that one in. That's a, a series the expansion of which you're going to need to know for the final exam. And it may come in handy on a couple of problems because it is, in some problems, kind of a shortened version of Taylor expansion. Um, if Now, we had kind of a basic level um, binomial series problem on the last test, on test four, was 1 plus x to the negative one-third, right? Um, so if you made an error on that one, on that problem, look back 
because there were some errors. Here's one of the errors is that the factorial was forgotten. And then another error is that we've got an x to the 1 here, and we've got larger powers of x as we go. And I, I know that is something we hadn't done a great deal of, um, but hopefully you can get that corrected prior to the final exam. So we have this thing. So let's expand that, and then we'll subtract it from 1, and then we'll see if we can eliminate some of the terms to get this um, proportionality that's requested at the end of the problem. So this ought to be 1 plus k. What is k? Negative 2. Negative 2, and our x value is going to be replaced by lowercase d over capital D. So we're going to have powers of this like we're supposed to have. So what do we have here? Negative 2. Okay, and then we've got negative 2 what? Negative 3. Negative 3. D over D squared. Does that work? And let's get one more. Negative 2 negative 3, and I, I know this happens, and this is good that it happens, but kind of remind yourself that you've got to generate this from the start. I know everybody in here, once we've got this term, it's easy to pick up that pattern from this point in the problem. So you've got to ask yourself, can I get this started so that I can easily pick up this pattern? That's kind of the crux of binomial series expansion. And so on. Does that look right? All right, well, let's throw this. In here. Let's see if we can um, take care of all the signs and all the simplification that we need to as we go. We're going to have 1 minus this. Well, this also has a 1, so the 1s are going to drop out, right? And then everything else that follows is going to be subtracted. So this 1 and this 1 knock each other out. We're going to have what? We're going to be subtracting this term. Uh, we're going to be subtracting this term. It's going to be what? This is by itself, this is positive, right? <coughs> but we're going to be subtracting it. So negative 3. And we could leave that D, lowercase d over capital D, the quantity squared. Uh, here's three negatives. So that one's going to be, when it's subtracted, it's going to be positive. What are we going to have here? Four. Do you think that's enough to actually generate the pattern? It seems to be a 2 and then a 3 and then a 4. If we had to make our guess, we would probably say Negative minus 5, five right? Five. We're not going to need that. Um, checking the directions again. When capital P, the point P, is far away from the dipole, so for large values of D, really know what that is, but um, compared to the lowercase d, it's going to be larger. Um, we want it to be approximately proportional to 1 over d cubed. If d is large, 
let me put in here compared to lowercase d. Suppose I truncated this infinite series right there. And could I get away with that, I guess, is the question. Because if d is really large compared to this one, even though this gets squared, this is a much larger number squared. So these terms, lowercase d squared over capital D squared and so on, they get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go. It may not be quite that exaggerated in the first term, but we're going to dispense with those. And let's see what we get. So I'll go ahead and use approximately because we are truncating the series. And what do we get? Let's see if we get what it is that they asked us to end up with. And here we are pretty near the end of the problem and I really don't have any higher level of understanding of these opposite charges and the dipole and the distances and you don't necessarily need it to do the mathematics behind a lot of these problems. So I see a d squared times d which I think was part of what they wanted. So I see a capital D cubed and a 2 and a q and a d. Let me rewrite that. 2 q d times 1 over d cubed. So I contend that we're done with this problem. Why is that? <coughs> Directions are show that E, okay, I've got E on this side. E is approximately, got that, proportional to 1 over d cubed. Well, here's 1 over d cubed. What if something is proportional to something? <coughs> Isn't there a what that interrelates them? A constant, okay? Some kind of constant of proportionality. So there is the constant that interrelates E and 1 over d cubed, capital D cubed. So, end of problem. Yes? Um, why did you separate the 2 times d over d from all the uh, Looking ahead to what they wanted, they wanted a d cubed. So I already had a d squared. So I, I basically knew I only needed the first term. But how can we justify getting rid of these terms? d is supposed to be a much larger number, capital D, than lowercase d. So hopefully we're not getting rid of a whole heck of a lot. The higher powers of this quotient should be getting closer and closer to zero. So kind of knowing where we're headed helps, but also dispensing with the rest of the terms, we've got to be able to justify that. Anything else on this problem before we leave it? Sorry, that should be approximately, right? Okay, everybody should have their test four back. So why don't we begin our exam review with that. Um, first one is an alternating series you should prepare for, and I don't know right now, I've got to sit down and write this exam out based on what your four tests are and what we've covered since the final exam. Um, since the final exam, you can pretty much lock in a binomial series problem a little more complicated than the one we had here because this is just kind of bare bones, uh, one plus x to the k. So you may actually have to manipulate it a little bit first to get it in that form, make a substitution for x, and then make a decision what your k value is. Not that much worse than this, but be prepared for one just a little bit 
uh, more involved in this. Uh, probably not any of these applications because most of them are kind of lengthy. Uh, what we did yesterday and the error estimate took pretty much the whole class, right? I guess I could just have one of those on the exam and that'd be the whole exam. No. No. Nah. That's not a good idea. Uh, so probably none of those just because of the time considerations. But I think they, having been through them, might have a net effect of making the binomial series that we do have on the test uh, a little bit more mundane for you because we've done some that are worse now. Uh, back to question one, alternating series. Um, you should be able to recognize that as an alternating series. Whether it's in its expanded form, that's easy. They alternate in sign. Or in the closed form, the sigma notation form, that negative 1 to the n is a pretty dead giveaway. And then you have to do pay attention. And I think this got a couple of you. I didn't intend for it to trip you up. But the first series starts at 1 n equals 1 and not n equals 0. So I think that got a couple of you and you lost a couple points because you started yours at 0, which generated an extra term and made the sum quite different. So pay attention to where it starts. Negative 1 to the n means it's alternating. We do have a special convergence test for alternating series. Two parts. How does that go? Okay, the n plus first term is smaller than the predecessor, the nth term. And again, we're not, we're throwing out the negative and positive alternation stuff. So, kind of the argument, the rest of the argument other than the negative one to the n. So is that true? It means it's ultimately decreasing. Now, you've what you can't do, and uh, I think I had one person do this, maybe two people on the test, is you can't just write this down and say, you know, check, yes. Uh, you've got to make it specific to the problem that, that we're doing. So in this problem, you've got the solutions. If you didn't get it correct, most of you wrote that step out. And I, I think it's, some of you even wrote out why it's true, because you have a larger denominator, which makes for a smaller fraction. But if, if you wrote it out and you've justified it and you've moved on to the second point, then you're good. But you've got to make it specific to that problem. And the second one, other than the negative 1 to the n, so the, the other part of the argument, if we work our way is that zero. So are the terms disappearing as we work our way out to the right? Not quite as stringent, really, as some of the other tests. But because it's alternating, these two things, if it's ultimately decreasing and the value of the nth term goes to zero, that's good enough. We've seen series that the alternating version is convergent, and the positive term series, that is its counterpart, is divergent. Namely, what? <laughs> the harmonic series. The regular positive term harmonic series is divergent. Its alternating counterpart is convergent. So it is not quite as stringent of a test because of the fact that it's alternating. Uh, take the series, write a few terms out. Uh, if we are finding the sum, if we want to deal with a certain error tolerance for the sum, where do you search for the first term to delete if you've got a certain error tolerance? Where do you want to stop it? And you want to add the first four, add the first seven, add the first 11. How do you make that decision? Okay, wherever you're going to stop, let's say you're going to stop at n equals four, then you want to look at the next term right? Basically the first omitted term. 
If it's smaller in magnitude than your desired level of accuracy, ignore the sign, then that's good. You can delete that one, gather up the predecessors of that one, add them up, and there's your desired level of accuracy. So that should all be um, shown on the solution to the test that was handed out. You needed to use that one. Yeah, the example we did in class, we used the term that had like the four zeros or five zeros. Because like your answer isn't correct in four decimal places because the next one will take away one of the decimal places in that one. Okay, so we ask what, this is good, this, because if I've made a mistake in grading, today's a great day to, to catch it. So what was the level of accuracy that was desired? Four decimal places. So I guess we have to ask ourselves the question, what, what decimal place could potentially affect the fourth decimal place? Um, so I flagged this as the fifth term, which is point zero 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 three four three. Is there a chance that adding that or subtracting that could affect the occupant of the fourth decimal place? Yeah, actually that there is, right? Yeah. Because if the occupant of the fourth decimal place, let's say, was two point zero 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 I'm sorry, the occupant of the fifth decimal place was two point zero 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 two and we added this in that would make the two a five and then we're talking about it affecting that right, right. so that that is correct so please change that that we should actually gather in the fifth term here because there is a chance that that number even as small as it is and it has no, nothing in the fourth decimal place Adding it or subtracting it could affect what occupies the fourth decimal place. So if that causes me to add back in some points, see me at the end of class and I'll write that down so it gets changed. Uh, but we should actually go on to the sixth term, which should become the error term. And that should make the sum, I guess it could make it potentially 2, 8, what is this term? Subtracted? Fifth term is subtracted. Negative 0.2835? Okay, I think that's correct. So if I need to change that, see me when we're done today and I'll change that. So that question that we need to ask ourselves is could that decimal affect the accuracy at the desired level? And in fact, this one could. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, number two. Um, it is alternating. By the way, um, well, let me scrap that. This one, um, because of the X powers of X plus two, probably is uh, an indicator that and plus we're searching for the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence. Ratio test is written all over this, even though it's not actually said to use that. Certainly you should plan on using the ratio test in some way, shape, or form on the final exam. We used it a lot in Chapter 8. Um, and there's often, there's a lot of stuff to keep track of. In this problem, you've got powers of 2 in the numerator and the denominator. You've got powers of x plus 2 in the numerator and denominator. And you've got an n in the numerator and an n plus 1 in the denominator. So if you slash something and mark it out, when you're looking at x plus 2, by the way, all this is in absolute value, right? So when you start getting rid of things, uh, for example, the twos, 
remember that there's going to be a 2. If one of the powers of 2 is one larger than the other one, there's going to be a 2 somewhere. Where's the extra 2 going to be in the denominator? So either and if you do mark out the exponent and you want that 2 to remain, you better circle it or something so it doesn't get lost because there's a lot of stuff that's going to be slashed here and reduced or simplified. We've got powers of x plus 2 here powers of x plus 2 here, where's the x plus 2 going to remain? We've got one more of those up here. So you've got an extra x plus 2. And the other one is n approaching infinity. What happens to n over n plus 1? That approaches 1, right? So there's a lot of stuff going on, so make it clear what's remaining and where it's remaining. So you've got x plus 2 over 2, and if you want to call that absolute value of x plus 2 over 2, that's fine. But that's the ratio, and we want that to be less than 1 if this is supposed to converge. And some of you, I know, could kick yourself because you did all the hard part right, and you multiplied by 1 half at this stage multiplied by one half? You've done, done all the hard work, now we've got to do a little arithmetic. Uh, don't think multipli multiplying by one half is going to help the term that's in the middle. Don't we want to multiply by two, right? A couple of you had your um, inequality symbols kind of out of whack there too. You might want to check those. All right, so ratio test. Uh, interval of convergence, we would add 2 and, I'm sorry, subtract 2. So our initial kind of first look is negative 4 to 0. And a couple of you stop there. You're not quite finished on a ratio test problem in determining the interval of convergence. Um, because if x were negative 4, Back up here to the ratio test, we'd get 1, so the test fails. If x were 0, back up here to the ratio test, we would get 1. And again, the ratio test fails when the limit is 1. So we have to do those by hand. So check those out. I think it diverged right at negative 4, and it converged. So our final interval of convergence looks like that. And the radius, it is centered at negative 2, which that is, that interval. And the radius of convergence is 2. Uh, third problem, power series. We also did a lot with power series. There, there's a whole lot to choose from, from this test. And we, even though we weren't progressing through the text real rapidly, the latter part of chapter 8, there was a lot that was in there. And all the power series stuff we used over and over and over again. In fact, the first time we saw that was in this form, right? And we saw it in this form initially. What is that? Where's that from? <coughs> Infinite geometric series. Now, we can't say that it converges to this until we know what else is true about that infinite geometric series. So if it's negative 3 fourths, we're good. If it's positive 2 thirds, we're good. And if it's not something we can actually quantify in terms of a numerical value, then we have to then find the interval of convergence. So in this problem, Most of you did the problem this way, where you saw the 9, and you did not want a 9 there. You wanted a 1 there. So you divided the numerator by 9, and the denominator by 9. A couple of you just pulled a 1 ninth out in front, and then you reinserted that at the end of the problem. That's fine.
So if we want to put it in this form, we get the 1 in that position, and then we, if we don't have subtraction, we convert it so that it is subtraction. So that ought to be the first term, and that ought to be the ratio. So if you want to write it out, and about half of you wrote it out in expanded form, and half of you wrote it in the closed sigma notation form, it's fine. doesn't matter as long as they're equivalent. So the first term, that's a giveaway. That's just whatever is in the numerator. And if you pulled a one-ninth out, your first term would be x, but the one-ninth times that x would eventually be x over 9, so the end result is the same. So we would then take that first term times the ratio, first term times the ratio, again, so the ratio will have been used as a factor twice by the time we get to the third term. It's always one behind. So if you wrote that out, hopefully simplified it. Um, it looks like the denominator, there's nine, there's a nine squared, so it looks like nine, nine squared, nine cubed. Looks like the denominator is just powers of nine. And in the numerator, what's it look like as you So the negative squared is positive. x squared squared is to the fourth times this x is x to the fifth. And this is 9 times 81, 729. Is that right? So if you wrote that, fine. I think I've said that, that on the directions, it doesn't matter expanded form or closed form. But if you do write it in closed form, probably be a good choice on your part to write it correctly in closed form. Uh, some of you kind of started from this first term times the ratio to the nth. As long as you started that at zero, we can get away with that because the ratio doesn't really come into play until the second term of the series. And if you started it this way, There's an x. Um, I would recommend taking the negative 1 to the n out of here, which leaves, what, x to the 2n? Is that right? And we've got a 9 to the n, and then we've got another 9 down here. Does that take care of everything that's present to the right of the sigma notation? Uh, x to the what? 2n plus 1? By the way, 2n plus 1, if you double a number and then you add 1 to it, it's guaranteed to be what? Odd. Odd, right? So 2n by itself is even. 2n plus 1 is always odd. And in fact, that's what we have in our series. And what? 9 to the n plus 1, if we start n at 0? I know some of you started in at 1, and you still got it correct. Just kind of adjust back from what we have here. I don't Personally, I don't see a difference in this answer and this answer. It's just kind of your preference of how you want to write it. Uh, we talked about number 4, about the hyperbolic cos uh, cosine, the cosh function. Uh, we also threw in the hyperbolic sine. They are very closely related to the regular circular trig counterparts, but they have to do with points located on a um, unit hyperbola as opposed to a unit circle. Uh, five on this test was really not meant to be um, a difficult question. Um, I really kind of thought it was almost like a gift question, but many of you rejected my gift. Um, so I think we talked about going into the test that it would be good for you to know, and I, I still stand by this statement, I think it would be good for you to know this. You could develop it, but it's going to, I think, be a waste of your time. Sine of x 
we decided sine was an odd function, right? So we should have odd powers and odd factorials. X is really X to the 1 over 1 factorial. It is alternating. And I know that we don't want all of mathematics to be this memorized, tremendously large body of memorized facts. But it, you know, some of it comes in handy. If you're going to memorize some of it, it's going to save you some work. Uh, that's the sign of x. And these x's that appear on the left side of the equation and the right side of the equation are the very same thing. So if we want to take that and now talk about the sign of, instead of x, the sign of x squared, everywhere there's an x, there should now be an x squared. And we've talked about that. We did some problems like that. And the real goal of the problem is to integrate this. Now we have a power series. And I didn't really address this in the problem. Do we have a choice? Do we have another way of integrating that? <coughs> what about if you let u equal x squared? du is 2x dx. Aren't we out of luck with that method? Because we don't have an x anywhere in the integrand? So regular substitution, in fact, I don't really know that we have another method for this. So if we want to integrate this side, which we do, we can integrate this side and accomplish that. <coughs> Excuse me. So it should be the integral of that, x cubed over 3, this is really x to the sixth, right? So if we want to integrate that, it's going to be the coefficient that's already there, 1 over 3 factorial, x to the seventh over 7. Here's an x to the tenth. <coughs> Integral of x to the tenth is x to the eleventh over 11, and so on. So we know or develop fairly quickly the sine of x, its Taylor series. We then replace x with x squared or something else. I mean, think about what I could do for an exam question here. Instead of x going to x squared, it could be x going to x over 5 or 2x or negative 3x. And then we could integrate that new function by integrating each piece of its expanded power series. Now we are doing an indefinite integral and every time we do an indefinite integral we should put a c or a k value. And I don't think we have any additional information so that we're going to be able to find that c or k value. Uh, real quickly, number six is very similar to this. Again, in your library of functions, I think it would be, and this one, by the way, if you don't remember this, this takes, I'm sure, less than a minute to develop because all the higher derivatives of e to the x are e to the x. You want the higher derivatives evaluated at 0. e to the 0 is 1 each time. So it's going to be Basically, just the other part of the Taylor expansion is all you need. Generically, this would be handy. This is, I guess, more specifically a Maclaurin series, but still is Taylor because we're evaluating at a certain value, just the value is simpler. So a couple of you um, on the fourth problem made a mistake here, and hopefully you'll get that corrected prior to the final exam. You did find the higher order derivatives, but you, in, you evaluate each of the higher order derivatives at 
zero, not at the end value that we are happen to be on at that particular point in time in the expansion. So if you need to use that to develop it, it doesn't take long to develop this one. That's e to the x. How about e to the x squared? What we just do in going from sine of x to sine of the quantity x squared? Just replace it, right, in the expanded version. And then we want to multiply that by x squared. Just run an x squared through there. And again, some of you did this in the um, closed form and may have actually gotten there a little bit quicker. Uh, we've got an x squared times everything. Let's figure out what e to the x is. Well, normally e to the x is x to the n. Well, now we've got x squared to the n over n factorial. And what do we do with that x squared that's out in front? If we want to pull it in here. Doesn't that add 2 to each power? So this is x to the 2n. I guess we want x to the 2n plus 2. Does that work? Well, the first term is x squared. When n is equal to 0, is that what we get? The next term is x to the 4th. When n is equal to 1, is that what we get? Tell me something about 2n plus 2, and then we'll stop today. Even. Even. And how are the exponents going to progress? They're all going to be even, and they're going to go up by 2. And they're going to go up by 2 because you're doubling in before you add something to it. So anytime you double it, you go up by increments of 2. If you triple something, you go up by increments of 3, and so on. And again, I don't care if you use this one or this one. Those are equivalent to me. All right, we won't meet tomorrow. We'll be back in here on Friday. Bring the rest of your tests. If I had a correction to make on your test, bring that up, and we'll take care of that now.